like to introduce uh, tonight uh, Eugene Robinson, a Pulitzer Prize winning writer uh, for his uh, coverage of the 2008 presidential race uh, that elected our first African American president, Barack Obama. And uh, Eugene Robinson now serves as chair of the Pulitzer Prize board. Uh, he is a twice weekly columnist uh, with the Washington Post, which is syndicated through 262 uh, newspapers around the country. So lots of folks read his uh, points of view. And uh, through his writings and television uh, commentary, he has helped us interpret and understand the complex world in which we live. Uh, and he certainly has helped me cut through the noise with a uh, lucid, heartfelt, and intelligent, uh, intelligent perspective. Uh, we applaud his work, and we are honored he has agreed uh, to be here with us tonight. So please join me in welcoming Eugene Robinson. Thanks so much. Um, uh, well, first, thanks, uh, thanks everybody for coming out in this uh, lovely Boston weather. Um, uh, <laughs> An evening, and actually, you know, Boston weather or not, it is really a delight uh, to be here on every level. Um, one important level is that I'm here. I'm not in Washington. I'm not dealing with whatever you know insane thing happened or can insane thing happen today. I'm not um, arguing, uh, trying to get a word in as Edge was with Chris Matthews or. Trying to figure out that whole Joe and Mika thing, or <laughs> which got a little weird the other day. Um, uh, so, um, you know, we, uh, when I was talking to Regina, we were trying to figure a title for this talk, and we came up with Power to the Past. And, and, and really, that is, that is what this collection is about history. That's the, 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 the sort of uh, connecting tissue, and and so that's what I'm going to talk about mostly this evening. Uh, but then I'm going to take questions, and we'll just take you know we'll talk about uh, anything. Um, sometimes we need to vet about current events as well. Um, so, uh, um, you know, February is is Black History Month. Um, I have long argued that it really needs to be renamed. It re needs to be called American History Month because African-American history is American history. There is no American history without an African-American history. It simply does not exist. It certainly doesn't happen this way. Um, <clears throat> you all will find this um, hard to believe, but sometimes I, after I write a column that um, uh, makes some people believe that I don't want to make America great again, um, <laughs> I'll get an email that says, you know, if you don't like it here, should go back to Africa. And um, I, I, seriously, in 2018, I get that email. And uh, so every once in a while, you know, I, I know it's, there's no point in it, but I'll, I'll, I'll write back. Um, you know, I, my folks have actually been here a lot longer than yours. So, um, so maybe you ought to be thinking about going back to Europe. Um, and um, it's not a really constructive way to engage with that person, but there actually is no constructive way to engage with that person. It makes me feel better to say that, but it's true. Um, so, to the best way I can sort of explain how this collection came about, um, and and first let me say it's the the. Certainly, the principal collector is my wife, Avis. She couldn't be here tonight. She has some, some family things she has to deal with. But, um, you know, she is the one with the, the eye and the nose and the, the, the feeling in her fingers. Um, uh, but I think the best way is to tell a couple of, of, of stories and a couple of stories of personal history. So um, I'll talk a, a bit about Avis and, and her family. Um, uh, she traces her family back on her mother's side uh, to southeastern Virginia, the sort of area, if you can picture a map, kind of between Richmond and Norfolk. If you were to draw a line from Richmond to Norfolk and about halfway down that line is a county called Sussex County. 
And so that's where her mother's side of the family uh, grew up. They were um, part of a large family down there called the, the, uh, named Chambers. Uh, and it's, a, it's an interesting thing when you go down to Sussex County um, and you start meeting people, you meet black Chamberlises and you meet white Chamberlises. Um, lots of both. Uh, you, um, uh, and you also meet Chamberlises who look kind of Native American. And, um, and you kind of wonder how all that happened. Well, um, well it did. And um, uh, so Avis's mother, is an extraordinary woman named Annie, Coll Annie Collins. Um, she has passed away, but um, she grew up in, she was born in Sussex County on the, the, the family's home place, a uh, 20-acre piece of land down there, uh, in, a, in a very, I was going to call it a very modest house, um, it was a very, very modest house. Uh, they were poor. Um, uh, uh, and her life was just extraordinary. She was born, I think, in 1926, maybe. Um, uh, the family, um, her parents divorced. Her mother moved her and her two sisters to Baltimore. Um, uh, her mother was a, a seamstress, did tailoring for people, uh, found a way to scrape by. Um, and uh, uh, my mother-in-law, Annie Collins, uh, was a brilliant student. She went to um, uh, what would then be best black high school in Baltimore. She uh, went to um, Morgan State University in, in Baltimore in biochemistry. Um, we have a wonderful photograph, um, not part of the auction for obvious reasons, of her uh, working uh, in a lab coat in, in the labs at Johns Hopkins University in the 50s, um, when uh, the number of African Americans working in the labs at Johns Hopkins University was, was um, probably approximately one. Um, uh, she um, later went on to, to have a, a long uh, and distinguished career at the National Institutes of Health um, and worked in the labs there. She's just a brilliant woman who, if she had been born in another time and place, she might have been the one to discover, you know, to, to, to decipher the human genome, right? I mean, she has that, she had that kind of, that kind of mind. So, um, Avis and I were married in 1978, and, and we were actually in San Francisco when we met. And long story, but I got a job at the Washington Post in 1980, so we moved. Um, it, for her, it was moving home. For me, it was moving to a much better newspaper. So uh, we, came, we came to the Washington area, and uh, we bought our first house, our first little house in 1981 in, uh, in uh, Arlington, Virginia. Well, um, this was in 1981, if you recall, interest rates were double digits, and the economy was, I, I think I made like $28,000 a year as a rookie reporter at the, at the Post or something like that. And so I was going to say we had no money, but we really had a lot of negative money. We had like anti-money. We had we were so broke um, that, uh, that you can't believe it. And um, I, as a matter of fact, I, we had a, we, in California we had this wonderful little Fiat Spider um, uh, sports car uh, that we sold to make the last of the down payment for the house. So we were really broke. Uh, and uh, so her uh, so. Um, Davis's mom came over one day and said, look, there's this property in Virginia, it's the family home place, um, you have to buy it. And I said, Mom, we have no money, you know, we have no money. And she said, no, but you have to buy it. And, and it's been in the family for more than 100 years and you have to buy it. And so um, uh, it, it had, the cousin who had owned it had died and uh, without a will. So now this property is owned by about 12 people and it was going to be sold, it was going to slip away, they weren't going to pay taxes, whatever. So, and she said, you have to buy it, not only do you have to buy it, you can never sell it. So, <laughs> said, gee, uh, gee, the deal gets better and better, boss. Um, um, but, but we did. Um, so we, you know, somehow scraped together um, uh, the money. It wasn't a whole lot of money, but a whole lot of money if you didn't have any. And, uh, and 
we bought the property and, and, and we do still have it. Um, it was the family home place. Uh, and on the on the plat um, that's registered uh, with Sussex County down there, you look at the plat of the property and over in the corner there's a little box that says cemetery. And that's where that was the family burial plot, and that's where her ancestors were buried. And, and uh, it's, we've had that property since 1982, 1983. It was only the, the, the little box on the map was like way back in the woods, right? And so we had, we had never been able to find it exactly where it was until about four years ago. Uh, and we went down there and we actually found the cemetery plot. And we found a, a, a big headstone uh, for one ancestor who was born in 1809. Her name was Mariah. Um, we, we know from family lore a bit about her. We know she had a very long life. She lived close to 100 years. Um, and and we, we see many other depressions in the ground that clearly indicate graves. And we are just now, we've kind of cordoned it off and secured it. And we're just now in the process of trying to uh, almost doing the archaeology, finding out who's there and um, you know, who they are and where they are. Um, um, and so um, that saves his family. Um, and that's the sort of importance of history of her okay. I was born in Orangeburg, South Carolina, uh, in the house that my great-grandfather built. My great-grandfather was a man named uh, Major John Hammond Ford. He was a major in something called the Carolina Light Infantry. I still haven't figured out exactly what that was. But he was an interesting man and a character and a, and a Reconstruction success story. He was born in either 1854 or 1856, depending on whether you believe the family Bible or the gravestone. They disagree. Um, uh, his father, Henry Fordham, had been a blacksmith in Charleston, South Carolina, and had somehow become a free person of color before the war. We don't know how, but we see, we've see we seen him listed in census records as such. Um, his son, John Hammond Fordham, um, after the Civil War, uh, was able to sort of take advantage of that brief opening. And so he became a lawyer. Um, he became very active in Republican Party politics, and as one did in the day, he got a succession of uh, political patronage jobs, and, and, and first in Charleston and then in, in, in Orangeburg, where he was the coroner for a while. Um, he acquired some property. He built uh, the house that, uh, uh, that I grew up in, um, that my mother grew up in, that my grandmother grew up in. And, um, uh, and uh, uh, he... Um, uh, but in his declining years, the door of Jim Crow was shut, and so um, he was no longer able to work as a lawyer. He was no longer able to uh, occupy those political patronage jobs. He was. Um, uh, he spent his last years. Um, you know, fortunately, he had acquired some property, so he kind of sell a parcel of property and. And, uh, and live on that, but um, what had been, uh, what he had been permitted to achieve was taken away. When he died, um, there was, uh, there was in the bedroom, and this was way back in the 20s, I think, there was in the bedroom uh, of the house, and it's still there, a, um, a safe, like a big safe, like the kind that the um, Wiley Coyote tries to drop on the burger on his head, you know, that, that sort of cartoon safe. Well, there was there, there is actually one there, and of course he hadn't given anyone the combination, so no one knew. They had to get a locksmith, and they opened the safe uh, and found his papers inside. Um, there's correspondence uh, between him and Theodore Roosevelt. Um, there was um, uh, uh, the, his uh, draft of a speech that he gave that was covered in the newspapers at the time about progress of African Americans throughout the South um, uh, since emancipation. Um, there was uh, the, the, bill of, uh, the, the construction documents for the house. Uh, all of that was, was, uh, was 
in the safe. Um, so that's kind of my family's re uh, uh, reverence for history. So we both sort of sort of came up um, uh, believing that, um, as I guess um, Faulkner once wrote, the past isn't even past, in a way, and it and it and it really isn't. Um, uh, kind of fast forward in that house um, where I grew up um, in 1968, and you'll see there is some material here from uh, from the Civil Rights era and the Black Power era. Uh, in February 1968, students at the two historically black colleges in Orangeburg, uh, Claflin University and South Carolina State University. Uh, mounted a demonstration against a segregated bowling alley in Orangeburg. This is 1968, um, after you know Brown v. Board and the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act and everything else. Um, news of all that led Orangeburg apparently, and so the bowling alley was um, whites only, and it became the focal point of a demonstration was about more than the right to bowl. It was about public accommodations in, in Orangeburg and voting rights and. And uh, this this grew into a very big demonstration, um, uh, and uh, lasted for three nights. I remember after the second night of the demonstration, I, I got up um, uh, in the morning to look out the window because it was in the line of sight of our house, about 300 yards away. Um, uh, so I got up to look at the crowd, and, and my father, who was a very gentle man, um, yelled at me. Uh, in a voice that he'd never used, get down out of that window right now. And so I, I did. And he let me peek over the sill. Uh, across the street from our house was a line of 12 uh, highway patrol cars. And the state troopers were out of their cars, um, crossed behind the open doors with their long guns trained on the house two doors down from the house. And that was where the the um, activist from the Student Nonviolent uh, Coordinating Committee, SNCC, a man named uh, Cleveland Sellers, uh, had been staying. And they were coming to get him. They were coming to arrest him for like, stirring up all the color folk. And, you know. um, uh, so um, he had better intelligence than they had. So he was long gone. So there was no uh, gunpoint that morning. But that night, there was. Um, the state troopers claimed to have been fired on um, uh, from the campus. There was never any evidence of any weapons on campus at all. Um, no bullet cases, no nothing. There was no evidence. But the troopers certainly fired it at the campus, fired into the crowd. And, um, and uh, uh, when the smoke cleared, uh, three young men were dead, uh, and 27 other people had been shot, uh, mostly in the back. Souls of the they had, um, the only per person who uh, ever served uh, a day in jail um, uh, as a result of this was Cleveland Sellers, the organizer of the State Troopers were all um, exonerated and what can only be called a whitewash, um, very literally in this case. Um, if you jump ahead a few more years, uh, to that 2008 election. Um, on election night, I spent it with um, uh, my, at that point, somewhat dysfunctional MSNBC family. Because if you remember, um, Keith Olbermann and Chris Matthews didn't really get along with each other. Um, so uh, there we were around the anchor desk. It was Chris Matthews, and Keith Olbermann, Rachel Maddow, uh, David Gregory, and me. And, um, um, uh, at uh, a moment I will never forget, and there's some, some, some Obama-era um, items in this auction as well. Um, at 10.45 p.m., we heard through our little earpieces that, the, that the, uh, the network was going to call the election for Obama at 11. And uh, so I had two thoughts. The first thought was, um, gee, <laughs> Um, when they call the election for Obama, they're going to go to the black guy, right? The one black guy on the set. So 
I better think of something to say. So I quickly tried to think of something to say. And then my second thought was, I hope we have a break. And we did have a break. And both my parents were still alive at that time. And so I got to take out my cell phone and call my mom and dad and tell them that they had lived to see the election of the first African American president of the United States. And um, so that's the, that's the kind of time span that Avis and I think about a lot. We think about the, the world that our that our, that our parents were born into and the world that they lived to, to see and that, that they left. And, and all that has, um, all that has uh, uh, transpired, all the changes, all the struggles, all the triumph. Um, and, and that really is why the collection is called Please Remember. It's something that uh, Avis's mother said to her um, as she was failing it was shortly before she died. Um, uh, she wondered if ever, anyone would remember the, uh, that history uh, in, in all its fullness and all its richness, not just of the, of the people um, that we, you know, the, the bold-faced names that we know, but all the sort of extraordinary, ordinary people um, who, who literally built a nation. And um, as we learned, once you really get into that and you start collecting and you start understanding the power of objects, the power of a tangible physical object to, 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 to tell that story in, a, in, a, in, a, in just a, uh, a visceral, um, impactful, um, heartbreaking or jubilant way, but in a way that, that affects the senses, uh, um, you know, in a way that words don't, don't entirely do. Um, once, once you realize that and, and start telling the story, um, you end up with the collection. And that's, uh -huh. <laughs> that's, uh, and that's how we ended up with the collection. Um, I, you know, I, and then you have, and then you think of it, and um, I, I, I think you think of everything in its in context. Um, and um, we have to think in the context of now. And you know, one thing that's happening uh, in this country, uh, one sort of megatrend, is diversity. It's and, and the fact is that before the midpoint of the century. There will be no um, racial minority in the United States. It, we will all be uh, minorities. Whites will still be a cycle plurality, but not not 51 percent, not 50 percent. Um, that seems to freak a lot of people out. Um, I sometimes tell audiences um, uh, if I uh, that. You know, it's actually not that bad. I mean, you can you, you can get used to being a minority. It's kind of like you know, it's like remember the first day of kindergarten. You know, you have to you have to like share your toys. You have to take your to take a turns, take turns. Uh, you don't always get your way, but if you kind of stand in line, you know, you'll get there. It's okay. Um, but um, uh, well, some people don't quite get that, um, and. Uh, and I think that sort of makes the the the, the accurate, accurate and full recapturing of this country's history all the more important, um, because it is the case that this has always been a uh, a multicultural, diverse country in all kinds of ways from before the beginning. Um, and uh, it, it continues to be so. Uh, and I think that you know, historical truth uh, is, is powerful in sort of disproving this myth of a monocultural, monoracial America uh, that seems to have taken hold with so many people and seems to, in, in some ways, animate a lot of the, 
of the anger um, uh, that we see uh, in, uh, in our day and time. So, um, uh, so in that sense, um, that, that's the kind of thing that we were thinking about when we put the collection together. It's, that's some of what it means to me. There are individual uh, items that um, uh, that perhaps uniquely speak to me. That that, that uh, uh, for a page of the, of the North Star, Frederick Douglass's newspaper, I'm a newspaper guy, and um, uh, and uh, just to see that uh, and to see his name up there in the corner as you know, editor uh, uh, is. Um, it's the kind of thing that I find uh, energizing, renewing, uh, and validating uh, at a time when um, there are many days when I kind of um, feel a little put upon by, um, by events and personalities um, who do not need to be named. Um, uh, and it's a, it's a reminder um, uh, that uh, of the power of the free press, of the power of, uh, of the truth. And um, uh, so um, uh, so that's one thing that really means an awful lot to me. And uh, another thing that does, and kind of oddly, because I didn't know anything about black dolls before uh, Ava started collecting them. And I was helping her do some cataloging, and so I, I actually up and uh, books and kind of uh, pictures and so um, uh, you know I can talk to manufacturers but that that Leo Moss doll the early African American uh, doll maker uh, there's something sort of poignant about it that just um, um, uh, that speaks to me and the dolls in general say something about representation of black female full female form they say something about um, uh, they, they raise questions about who was it made for, who was it given to, who was played, who played with it, who, you know, who loved it. Um, uh, and, and so those really sort of reach inside as well. Um, so I'm going to stop, uh, stop talking, uh, but I would like to take questions and, um, and uh, just have a chat. So thank you. <laughs>